Hey TV fans and hey Stranger Things fans, I return to the world of the Upside Down, the 1980s. So this is my review of Stranger Things 2, Chapter 5, and it is called Ding Dog. And for a while I didn't know why it was called Ding Dog, but it's actually because it's the name of a game, which Mad Max or Max as she said, well, I known is very good at and is in fact the top scorer. And there's an it sort of quite an important scene in this episode with Max and Lucas in the arcade itself. But I'll come back to that later. But this is a really good episode. I, I think this might be the best episode of the season so far. Things are really hitting top gear. And the one thing to say about it, because I'll start off with the Hopper stuff and that side of the plot, because the big cliffhanger last time was him being trapped in the Upside Down and, you know, in peril. So, me and Rachel have both said that at times this show, for a, like a mainstream sort of show, is, is surprisingly tense and edgy and quite scary it definitely leans into the horror moments big time i think you can see the duffer brothers are like big horror fans and this episode i tell you what i think could be up there for like the most eerie the most like creepy because the way this whole thing with hopper you know underground is shot with you've got like things coming at him from the walls you know it feels a bit like that scene out of temple of doom but you've got like yeah sort of things squirting out of walls you've got like creatures popping up you've got um fi finally because at first he's sort of sort of like self-defense that kind of thing and it really smells in there and it's hard for him to breathe so he sort of like improvises and puts something over his nose like to block that out but in the end he is like trapped and these things form around him and and like tackle him to the ground and are like suffocating him so a lot of suspense over if he's actually gonna make it out of there alive and <clears throat> the whole drama around saving him is is on like the sort of trio of Joyce Mike and Will because they have to sort of figure out where he is exactly and, and how to save him and Will starts having visions so he gets visions that Hopper is in danger um, and what I like about this is how they work Bob into the plot and it sort of feels like really natural organic it doesn't feel forced because obviously at this point Bob knows absolutely nothing about this stuff and, and what's been going on so they sort of get him to help out without telling him what the hell's going on because of course he loves Joyce he'll do anything for Joyce and he obviously respects Will and likes Will so he comes home at one point and they sort of get him to use his ex expertise his sort of nerdy expertise if you like and he figures out then will is actually like with his drawings you've got all these trails all these lines and he eventually figures out that being bob then they are to create a map you know they are like a map so they have to try and piece everything together and this slowly leads them to to where hopper is so that that's a, a smart way to to work bob into the whole thing and, and it's a good way to use his character because otherwise as i said there's a danger sometimes with that sort of character then he could just feel like a bit of a you know a supporting character he's just there to be like a boyfriend to joyce in her life a bit but also a bit of a goofy comic relief Th this actually gives him a more of a purpose in the actual plot so by the end of the episode they find Hopper and I tell you what things really come to a head because Joyce and Bob Joyce isn't messing around she like smashes into the earth to try and find Hopper and and Bob throws himself in so he really earns big brownie points in this episode he comes in after her and like the big cliffhanger of the episode is that they're both down there 
But at the same time, the CIA have come out. We see the familiar white vans that we saw last season. They come out because they've like twigged what what's going on, and and they've you know discovered it. So they're they're sort of going after it, and that they actually saved them in the end. Um, and the government, we see like these these guys in their suits again they start using the frame flower to like destroy the area but it sort of ends actually with will having like another type seizure like things have just got too intense he's just reacting to, to what's going on on the outside and it's a packed episode there is a lot going on maybe a bit too much at times but uh, most pretty pretty much most of it is like justified and is adding stuff and I, I just think as like a horror style episode it is very effective and there's a lot of tension and some some great character work so I'll switch over to the L plot because she has the other big plot in this episode and that's because she, f- through like the government files which she found in Hopper's well, the cabin in in like the sour, she realizes that then her birth mother was around and was you know involved with like the Matthew Modine character, the scientist from the first season, and so she she creates like a psychic connection where she finds out the address and she goes to the house. And this is another good payoff from season one because we were we were introduced to this character in season one when Hopper and Joyce went to visit her. Um, so so it's another good like add on to that. But Elka and of course she's she's been ill for years. Like she's sort of in a comatose sort of state where she barely responds to the outside world. So obviously the sister answers the door. And Al is told, sorry, she can't respond. But the sister does say she always believed you would come home one day. And she actually offers her a place to stay, which at, at the moment I think Al is like likely to take up because of the fight with her and Hopper. But things take a turn when the lights start flashing on, on the wall. And Al... Eleven starts to suspect um, then it's because the mother senses her presence and and that is the case so she starts connecting to her and through this um, not only do they they actually have communication but also Eleven finds out some important things about her past she finds out that she was taken at birth from the mother she finds out that they were lied to, like her her birth mother was lied to. She was told that Eleven actually died in childbirth. Jane is like her her who real name, by the way. But then the mother went after her and actually went to the lab. Now some of this is a bit, you know, farcible and. It seems a bit unlikely she would be able to break into a government lab like this, but in any case, it's. I guess in a way you could say it's like the mother's memory, so it might might be a bit unreliable. But she she breaks in anyway and is there obviously to get her her daughter back. But then she they get hold of her and they give her shock treatment, and this just explains, you know why exactly she, she's been traumatised and why she's had this disease. But it, it's obviously a big moment for the Eleven character. It pays off a lot of sh- stuff with her. And she she actually, you know, gets to reconnect with her, with her birth mother and see her for the first time ever, really, because she was obviously taken away as, as a child. And we've said before, me and Rachel, in our reviews and... There's something tragic about Elle's story, and that's why there's something really weird about the whole thing with the Modine character in season one. Because, in a way, although he's like a total sleaze bag and totally un- untrustworthy, he he was the only like parent that Elle really knew growing up. So, 
because of that, this is a really big moment, her finally getting to meet her birth mother. So, so good stuff on that side of the plot as well. There's some interesting stuff with Max in this episode, with her and Lucas, because Max is, like, really mad that she's been lied to by the group and they're not telling her everything. And Lucas, at first, is just saying, it's for your own good, we, we can't risk anything and and Max obviously isn't taking that for an answer and I think after a while Lucas feels bad and wants to tell the truth and you get some good scenes with them in in this episode where he he actually like tells her the story about what happened to Will and well the truth about what happens to Will but Max thinks it's it it's a story that he's made it up and it's that old sort of scene where at first she reacts like she believes him but of course she's setting him up for saying no no that's you had me going but that's clearly a story so you get a scene later where he actually tricks Max and sort of lures her to the arcade and the the trick is then the guy from the first episode, the guy who like runs the arcade, I can't remember his name, but he's a classic sort of like nerdy, dorky type character. <laughs> Lucas actually promises him a date with Nancy. Um, I'm guessing it's still Nancy because that's the girl who he wanted a date with in the first episode. So Lucas being a bit naughty, but he obviously wanted to to get Max like on her own and talk to her about this stuff so I sort of like how there's a safe space and and it happens to be like this back room in the arcade that that is so fitting for like a 12 year old um so he he gets Max in in this room and said sorry this is the only place and another thing I'll say is then this stuff with Lucas and Max really sells how how big a deal this stuff is and it sort of sells how the characters take it so seriously the writers take it so seriously then these these especially these young kids i mean the, the they're holding out a lot and there's a lot of pressure on them where they know the consequences if if they tell someone and if it gets back to the CIA they know there could be big consequences so this really builds the stakes so at this point season two doing a good job of that um but yeah he actually convinces Max in in this scene that then he isn't crazy he's telling the truth and it happens when he tries to tell her more and then she goes back into the arcade and she kind of I think she goes back on the machine at one point, but Lucas is like... Because she sarcastically starts saying things, and, and Lucas, like, puts his hand over her mouth at one point. And says, no, no, no. And it's in that moment that, that Max realises that he's actually being serious. Now, it's debatable if she actually believes him, but she certainly believes that he believes this stuff I think in that moment so it's a good scene and just a couple of other bits on that on that stuff with Billy because we see another really nasty side to his character where he's bringing up the old racist sort of card with Lucas and Max because he sees them around school together like previously and when he when Max gets in the car he makes this comment about there's certain people in in this world that you can't you can't trust and he's one of them like clearly playing on on being a bit of a racist asshole there's just a vibe in the scene and then later on because he picks her up from the arcade and, and he sees Lucas again and and Max tries to convince him, oh, it's nothing. And again, the scene turns quite nasty because Max, he, he then threatens Max. He says, you know, you know the punishment for lying. So there's almost like maybe saying that then he might abuse Max or he might sort of hit her if, if 
you know, he feels she's lying to her. And so, definitely a nasty sort of vibe in, in those scenes with Max and Billy. I'm not quite sure what to make of that stuff. Um, I know me and Rachel are going to have, like, a season two discussion video at some point. So, I, I think we'll definitely have quite a long chat on Billy. Um... And the other stuff, which again is is enjoyable stuff, is is Nancy and Jonathan. Now, I know there's this long running debate, really, with me and Rachel over whether they they should be a couple per se or whatever, or is she more suited with Steve? You know, if you've seen previous reviews, you you'll know about our debate over that, but. I think this is just a really good episode for them and, and their characters because you get like a deja vu type moment where they actually spend the night in the same room and, and it's after that them leaving the lab and they they go to a motel together um, and it, it's again similar where because they're worried about the world ending sort of thing because of what they've seen at the science lab and there's some intimate type stuff where you get the sense that there's this growing attraction and Nancy kind of says you know what happened to us I was waiting for you and you could sort of read that as the maybe there are some feelings there like romantic feelings maybe there was something there previously and obviously she didn't pursue it because of Steve maybe but Anyway, the, the next day that they end up going to the UFO guy, the conspiracy theorist, who we saw in like the first episode of this season, and they tell him like who they are and what does he know, and Nancy's really on her game again because he's like put all this stuff on the board and the timeline and she corrects him on stuff she says you know the timeline isn't quite right and she says then um, you know 11 l it wasn't actually she's not actually a russian she 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 was born in in that lab sort of thing so puts him right on a few stuff and for a lot of like these scenes they think who is this guy? He's he's a bit of a joke, um, and, and he's dr drinking vodka at some point, getting drunk, and he's like, I'm thinking, and and he's a funny guy. I I like the actor. He brings a lot to like those scenes. But once again, you know, I, in Stranger Things, I think overall, like the younger characters are meant to be the really smart ones, and. They're supposed to be like the more proactive stuff. So this continues like that trend. But gradually this guy <laughs> does come upon a point. And, and it's when he starts putting water in like his vodka or something. And it's because they tell, tell him what they know. And they say, well, we're going to go to the press or the authorities or, or whatever. And he, he actually makes a good point, and his point is then, first of all, the average person won't believe you, but secondly, even if they do, it will only take one official person, like, from in a higher power to, like, discredit your story for, like, everyone else to question you. So that's where the, the putting the water in, in the vodka comes in, because he says you have to dilute to dilute your story you have to water it, it down you have to make it just change it a bit but still make it like credible enough and and then more people are likely to to believe you so good stuff again i think i think when nancy and Jonathan are doing the Mulder and Scully stuff, as I like to call it. I, I think you, you get some satisfying stuff with them. And the other reason this is a pretty kick-ass episode is because we actually get the start of the bromance, the ultimate bromance, which, of course, if you've seen all of Stranger Things up to now, you know is Steve and Dustin which is absolutely glorious because I've said before 
then Steve needs a bit more of a purpose this season and it's sort of from this point I think then then he has it a bit more because he goes to make amends with Nancy even though he thinks he, he he's got no reason to really feel bad but fair play t- to the old guy he goes there with with roses and Dustin has gone there he calls because he's calling a code red like earlier on in the episode trying to get the rest of the gang but none of them really respond or they Lucas responds and says I haven't got time and it's obviously to do with the situation with with his with his pet that's got out of control and and so Dustin goes around the house like the wheelers and like there's a funny exchange with him and Ted Ted who whose favorite line seems language in in response to Dustin swearing at him but there's some funny stuff with Dustin and Ted but it's confirmed that Mike's not home because of course he's over at the buyers um Nancy's not home and she's given a story that she's actually over at her friends which isn't true um so Obviously Dustin leaves, but then then he bumps into Steve, and um, Steve has these flowers, and Dustin's like, well, are they for Mrs. and Mr. Wheeler? He's like, no, and he's like, oh, good, and he just snatches them off him, and now I don't know exactly what he wants with the flowers, I guess it's just a way to convince Steve to come with him, because he snatches them off him, and he jumps in his car, I think, and he just says, hey, do you still have that baseball bat? He's like, yeah, oh, good, and and it, obviously they're, they're going to start working together, because he needs help. And he needs the baseball back to to get this this creature uh, all sorted out because he's already got it trapped because earlier in the episode he trapped it in like the cellar at his house um, and I almost forgot that scene but Dustin dresses up as you know dresses up in like baseball pads and it's absolutely glorious stuff and and he confronts the creature and gets it in the cellar so he wants Steve's help anyway. So, yeah. The start of a bromance, which is absolutely brilliant. Dustin and Steve, what a great pairing. And this stuff definitely gives Steve a bit more of a purpose as a character. I think it. I think him and Nancy have, have, have run their course. Sorry to say, Rachel. Okay, so that's Stranger Things, episode 5 of season 2. It's, it's going great, Guns. So that's my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. Share me out on social media. And I'll be back with more Stranger Things soon. Thanks guys. See you later.